happy hump fed day everyone i'm dale pinker how's everyone doing today i only say my name so i could remember it everyone doing okay we have the fed today so i was listening to the interview i did with jack schwager uh every once in a while i'll go back to some of these interviews uh you guys may want to consider it too because depending upon where your head is and where you're at on your journey, you can listen to the same thing and pick up different things that you didn't even notice maybe the first time you heard it. So everyone knows who Jack Schwager is, right? He's interviewed the market wizards, the best traders in the world, and, and Jack has deep knowledge of the market. And I'm listening to the interview, and I was discussing with him the difference between being a technical and a fundamental trader and Jack said that uh, fundamental traders run into more trouble if they're strictly fundamental because things never change so if the market is uh, fundamentally overvalued and it continues to go up to a fundamentalist uh, that's an even more compelling position because they don't see any visual change, whereas a technician uh, may say, with the example I'm going to give with Greg in a minute, that they're constantly assessing price and trends may change, uh, counts may change, harmonic formations may change, you could get new evidence with a different candlestick. So, uh, Jack's thesis is at least when technicians are wrong that there'll be a visual picture that's showing things are changing so that they have to reassess where if you're strictly a fundamentalist and those same fundamentals continue to persist and yet the market continues to move against you um, that's where some of the biggest trading tra tragedies occur and uh, look we could give Bitcoin for an example uh, we could give uh, stock indexes as an example. Talk of overvaluation, yet you never know how far a rubber band can stretch. Everyone with me? Uh, so you may want to take that into consideration. Uh, the best balance is what Blake does and what Steve does. And they consider both. And I've noticed, and here I want to talk about the professionalism of the team right now. And you know, the when I used to raise money for CTAs, most people would go and look at what their top for performing quarter was or year was. Uh, to me, what was most important was what was their worst drawdown. That's what I want to know. That's where the risk is. Uh, if you have a money manager and then what happens after the drawdown uh, a lot of people can't handle drawdowns they begin to over trade they start increasing leverage and exacerbate the drawdown where pros will stick to their plans stick to their leverage knowing that over time uh, that drawdown uh, will dissipate and they'll reach new equity level highs so uh, very important to know uh, what's a worst case scenario. So for managed money, if you're looking at a money manager, what you want to see is what's their worst drawdown. Everyone with me on that? You understand that? Not that they were up 18% last quarter, but you know, if you start having drawdowns more than 10%, uh, to me, that's a money manager I may want to avoid. So I could say the same thing for Greg as uh, an analyst. Okay, so yesterday the count was we were going to fail right around here. It was a little bit above the 61.8 level on USD MEX, but we extended actually to 78.6. So from this count yesterday, the way Greg's count, the way he was seeing it, was we could get a break all the way back down under this below. But because evidence has changed and we didn't fail from 61.8, we actually are rejected up around the 78.6 level. So uh, to me, that's 
like W.D. Gann saying, if you don't learn how to change your mind, you won't have any change left. That's what Grega did. Kudos to uh, Blake, who was probing the short side of USD Max and said he wasn't going to stay with it unless he got a red candle. There was no red candle. Uh, we'll find out how he handled the trade. But as you can see, uh, good traders adjust. And that's what Greg is doing here. So if you're still in the trade and you have your stops over the high, uh, it's still playable for a correction. But now, because of the recent price action, you have to lower your expectations from looking for a break under the below to just correcting this recent advance. Everyone with me? So when you get more information and you're still in the trade, maybe a bit underwater, you change your expectations on the trade as well. Give me a why if you're with me. So when evidence change, so should your expectations and possibly uh, even your position, totally. Maybe you just get out of the way and reassess, one in doubt, be out. Okay, everyone with me on that? So here is the, uh, here's the USD max right now. See, we're playing with the 78.6 level, so Grega would just be looking for some type of pullback here now. Okay, that's your lesson for the day. Uh, now we have the Fed. And yesterday I said I liked the way the pound was acting because of EG. And we did have uh, a retest of the lows. This, this was the low here yesterday near our opening. We took it out by a little bit, a stop hunt. Uh, my bias is to fade dollar strength. My guess is to fade dollar strength after the Fed. But as long as we're not closing under 33, 32.70, I still believe that there's potential on the upside in the pound. This high is still confirmed. It still looks like a continuation formation. But uh, your first inkling would be uh, closes under 33, that instead of this being consolidation, for a new move to new high that it ended up being distribution at 33, that could then take us back down to one and a half or 31. So I like when markets are in a position where they're good or bad from a, and they're close to that area and they've been challenging an area for a while, we challenged it here, right? Uh, much bigger lift we got out of there, uh, subdued into the Fed, uh, it's my contention that there's still a shot for a rally to new highs. Uh, yesterday, I talked about US dollar yen and US dollar yen, I talked about maybe we get to 80. That's pretty much, let me cover EG first. Now EG, I know that a lot of people are bearish here, but this was a pretty impulsive move, I think, and squeezed a lot of people. And I'm looking at the way it's pulling back here. And this is something else post-Fed. I, I might be uh, interested in um, maybe what we're going to form is some type of right shoulder here. Here's your left shoulder. Here is your head. Maybe we've got a right shoulder. we get got a higher low here, maybe 87.60 to 40, and you risk the lows. I'd go with that uh, because I still think there's a chance of higher numbers in euro pound most of the market is pretty negative euro pound so i i like the fact that after this big gain we're really kind of correcting and we never got seriously overbought but that we're correcting this 140 pip advance from the false breakdown more in time than in price everyone with me you're looking for one more high jess okay uh, that could happen after the Fed. So uh, there already is one divergence there. So Jess is looking for one more push up. Here's the one hour. Steve doesn't look at him. So as you can see, we've had one non-confirmation here. So maybe 1380-ish, something like that would be a nice fade according to Jess. And I've watched Jess trade for, I don't know, probably or his calls at least for about five years now and he's got an excellent eye so put that on your radar screen for the fed as well 
Uh, I have a great guest today, guys. And I know a lot of people, you know, as soon as there's uh, not commentary on how you can make a few pips, um, some people aren't as interested in the interviews. <clears throat> Today's guest, I've known Giuseppe Bazil. His uh, Twitter handle is at Fibstalker. Uh, you're you're going to want to hear this guy. He's won prestigious technical analyst awards in Canada. Uh, he has a little different take on markets. Uh, discovered a method to where um, he knows where program traders uh, their levels before the market gets there. Does a lot with uh, Fib as well, Fibonacci, as you can tell by his Twitter handle, Fibstalker. So looking forward to speaking to my friend Giuseppe Bazil. Uh, we came up uh, together with uh, the term that what he sees in the market are footprints. So footprints in the snow before the market gets there. Uh, at Fib Stalker Forex Go. Okay. So I'm ready to pass it over to my teammate, Mr. Discipline, if he's here. Hello, Steve. Good morning to you, my friend. Hey, Dale. Good morning, mate. How have you been? Good, buddy. So uh, we should have some excitement a little later on today. Yes. And unfortunately, I don't predict much excitement until then. Uh, as you, you as know, I've never asked you this, Steve. Um, do you hold positions? What's your philosophy on uh, holding positions into red events like the Fed today? I don't really have a fixed philosophy. I mean, let me be specific. I I will more easily um, hold positions that are, for example, in the money, because you know you can comfortably set uh, a, a, an order to get out of that position, even if that's in your profit. So, you know, in one case you're risking part of your profits, which is always easier to do. Um, then holding you, will you will you take a position into it if it's underwater if, if i'm going it's to all subjective it, isn't it? It, it it depends how you feel that day it depends on on how strongly you might feel about something for example there, there are okay. times that we had like serious event risk and i felt very strongly about it for example i felt very strongly that the risks were tilted one way or another in these occasions, I've, mm -hmm. I never had a problem uh, having a position or even establishing a position prior to the event. If I believe, for, for example, that the market is, is uh, seriously underestimating or overestimating a possibility. You know what I mean? Um, okay. So, so I've had no problem even establishing positions uh, prior to event risk in, in these occasions. But it also, has to do with, it also has to do with other factors. So, for example how early in the month it is, how, um, how well have you done in that month, uh, what exactly are you jeopardizing, it's, you know, there are, yeah. the, there are a lot of factors. That, many, many factors that go into it. Yeah, for example, I have to tell you that... Uh, yeah, like you're having a great month in gold, so I would bet if you have yeah. some positions in the metals, your metal shorts came home, so you, you, you're more confident going into this, you'd be more apt to take the position into it. Yeah, for example, that's a great example because, you know, although I would, I would definitely keep my position in gold because I've already booked uh, silver, if you remember, um, I also have an open position in the DAX, an open position in the NOC, both of those positions like slightly out of the money. I'm, I'm, I'm even contemplating of, of closing everything. I know it's just the 13th of December, but keeping in mind that uh, liquidity is going to thin out very much within the next 10 days and the fact that if I close all my positions at the moment I will have uh, I'm going to be positive on the month more than 6% you know it's it's still a good month and I'm, ev I'm even considering that possibility you know what I mean to actually close. you want to share what your results were for the year I'd rather, not, I'd rather not do that. They, they, okay, they were good, but uh, I'd rather not do that for other reasons, as you understand. Okay. I mean, I don't want people to expect too much or to, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. You, you might yeah. have a great year and... I, 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 I'm just from following you the last eight months, I, I would say that they're... That's what I want to say. They're, people they're, they're pretty green. green. That's they're pretty during green. The, the last eight months, you know, you've heard the vast majority of our calls. They, they know, yeah. you know, how we've done... Uh, give or take. So yeah. I, I'm always announcing, you know, when I close my positions, when I open them, 
you know right. how, how good or how bad they did so you know i think it's enough for people to have an idea you have great yeah I, I i love your transparency have you ever noticed uh, the revisionists on twitter they you know they call out a trade and you know something out uh, and they they forget you know something, I, I know the phenomenon very well, but I'll tell you something. I, I have very little time to spend nowadays on Twitter. So, for example, I have my Twitter feed always on, but I, I'm mostly nowadays going to just be looking at it when we expect some uh, data to come out or something is happening on a political yeah. level or, you know, I'm, I'm barely following like... Uh, you know, uh, constant feed or, you know, checking out what I, what I missed right. later on. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really not uh, following closely anymore, but I'm pretty sure that the phenomenon is still out there. Yeah. You know, maybe we should have some Instagram, you know, uh, I, yeah, I enjoy the interaction on social media. You know, I'm kind of a lonely guy. So, you know, I, I have a lot of virtual friendships. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should expand my horizons to Instagram. What do you think, man? Uh, I'm not even using it. I mean, uh, I know what Insta yeah, I, Instagram is, but I don't. I, I don't even have Facebook actually. Me either. Isn't it kind of like a Western Union Telegram, only it's on your screen, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> it's not delivered by mail. <laughs> <laughs> These were the days of traditional mail, eh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, when I was a kid, I was actually even collecting stamps, I remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah, stamp collection. Yeah. So uh, what are you going to do? So why don't you just uh, give us, uh, uh, you know, I tell people uh, react to the reaction. So maybe the best way we could prepare the community for this is have some levels that if the market gets there, yeah, that, that's that's, that's what I usually that's what I usually do. Uh, let's be very honest. Yeah. I don't have many different things to say from yesterday, simply because, as what as it usually true. happens, the market quiets down before some yeah. you know strong event risk. So it's not that things have really moved since yesterday or uh, technical uh, um, uh, positions. All have, right, well, have, uh, just uh, replay yesterday's video. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, what, what I'm going to do is what we usually do, it's with, which is exactly what you said. I mean, we're going to have a look at a few pairs and see what is best positioned uh, in case we get dollar strength, what is best positioned in case we, we get dollar weakness, right? Um, okay. So, I, 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 yeah, I think it's, it's a good idea to, to view it under, uh, under this scope and... Um, I'm pretty sure that people, you know, as always, have questions to ask. So uh, I think today is a good opportunity to ask questions since not much have, have changed yesterday since, uh, as I said, you know, we had very little movement, movement but perhaps people, you know, uh, are viewing or have some questions on some pairs we, we haven't uh, covered recently or whatever. So after I go th over, uh, you know, some of the majors, if somebody wants us to look at something uh, in specific, I will gladly do so okay buddy i look forward to it too so I, okay I'm um, out of your way now so let's see you know since we're talking about uh event that's mostly associated with the dollar i think that you know we should begin as as almost always in these occasions by by seeing two things one is the treasuries and two is the usd yen before we move to the rest okay so Treasuries. Treasuries are like literally uh, about to break uh, to break down. Okay, so either you interpreted this, which we were viewing it for some time, as a triangle, in which case we broke below it, we retested it, and we're moving lower, or you viewed this as a flat top, uh, or as a asymmetrical triangle, or uh, if you viewed this as a flat to flat bottom triangle which is the most conservative scenario in this case, because in the first case, we've already seen the breakdown. Uh, and I do believe that the first case, the symmetrical triangle, uh, was the valid interpretation. But, uh, you know, s since we are prior to event risk, let's readjust to this. You can still see that the treasuries are breaking lower. And, you know, that means that if today 
uh, we do see a rate hike and we do see uh, and, and we don't see too dovish commentary having to do with uh, the year that's ahead, I would expect the move lower to even perhaps pick up pace, in which case uh, the next uh, support is the double bottom that we had in 123.10, 123.18 to be exact, and then we just straight ahead moving to to, uh, to new uh, lows. And when we say new lows, we're talking about we have to go back to 2011, right? Uh, so, you know, that's going to be a very, very important break if we actually uh, make it below there. So the treasuries are telling us that, you know, the, they're looking forward to, uh, you know, to, to dollar strengthening. On the other hand, the USD yen is tested actually overnight. Most probably, I think you, you did see it, right? We had a little bit of a political risk. Uh, which, which state was it that actually um, Republicans uh, lost election and, and, and it was an upset? What was it? Minnesota? Minnesota? I'm not sure. What was it? Doesn't it was really Alabama. Matter. Alabama, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I put out a tweet. Uh, do, you, do you remember Roy Rogers? Oh, you're probably too young. But I said, because he rode up on a horse to vote, and I said, Roy Moore, I've ridden with Roy Rogers, and you're no Roy Rogers. <laughs> yeah, so uh, from what I know, he there was a scandal about him and, you know, like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So when Trump... Uh, he, was like, he was like Aqualung, only he lived it up, anyway. You know and... Aqualung, Jethro Tull? No. All right, we'll play it on YouTube later. Yeah, okay, you know. I will. So, um, so the thing is that, from what I understand, the 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 whole um, issue about it was that it makes somewhat harder uh, for the tax for the new tax plan to to be voted, right? For direct and indirect reasons. Um, He's not conceding the election. He's not conceding right now. So there'll probably be a recount. Still, though, from from what we know, uh, recounts yeah, very one less vote. It's one less vote in the Senate. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right. So um, you know, we we had some we had some risk of coming through due to that. That is why we also see this negative candle on the USD yen. Yesterday night, uh, European time at least night, we uh, the SPX was also trading lower quite a lot. I mean, quite a lot. Uh, for after hours, it was like minus 0.30, minus 0.35. It has now per per back its losses, so it's it's about to start flat on the day. Um, but the fact remains that the USD yen, you know, there are two interpretations here. I see a lot of people still viewing this as a head and shoulders as a potential head and shoulders formation, which can be the case. But for that to to be the case, we need to move lower and we need to do it like imminently today. Um, currently, though, we haven't broken below the 113, 113, 10 area. So, having to do with the, the, the USD yen, it's actually it, it tested support overnight. It's currently just above it. As long as this area is holding, you know, there is nothing more to say about it. So, in, in the in the short term, you know, somebody has to be constructive. Although, on the other hand. We have this huge descending trend line resistance, which we haven't managed to clear since uh, we actually found a high in uh, um, during the summer of 2015. So this is a very, very important trend line. And unless we clear it, unless we, we bridge above it, you know, we can't uh, turn uh, really uh, bullish the USD yen, you know, on the medium term. So it's currently trapped. Use the yen is currently trapped be, be, uh, between like a soft support and this like huge resistance, which is uh, like almost 100 plus higher. So there is space, even if we see some uh, USD uh, positive reaction, there is still um, some room until we actually find that resistance. So to be honest, I would not easily position myself um, uh, along the USD yen at least not for anything more than in the short term, because I would really, really want to see what this trend line is going to do 
if uh, if we actually uh, come back to test it as resistance once again. Okay, so I understand why somebody might want to be like long somewhere there with because you know the risk the reward risk ratio is like, like well defined, but on the other hand, I think that especially given the way that the USD yen has recently decoupled from almost anything else. I mean, if you see it's like trading in a range and instead of amplifying uh, event risk and uh, moves of other correlated, I mean, traditionally correlated assets, it actually dampens. Uh, so it's it, it's acting in a way that we've, we haven't gotten used to it uh, acting in, in, in the past. So I, I would be very careful with the USD yen, probably not uh, the pair I would choose to, uh, to to trade here. Now, on the other hand, we have the cable. The cable is holding. Um, uh, it, you know, it's barely holding, but it's holding like this uh, bull flag um, interpretation, let's say, which we don't know if that's going to be the case, but it's also holding above the 133, 132.80 area. As long as that's the case, um, you know, I think it's well positioned for uh, USD weakness. So for example, if we do see a USD uh, negative reaction, I think that the cable is at a good point uh, to rebound. And more or less the same applies to the Euro uh, USD. Okay, uh, it's, it tested yesterday 61.8. Um, the move lower has been quite underwhelming since you know we've put so many negative days, but after so many negative days, we haven't really retraced that much and that usually is is a characteristic of a move that is corrective and not of a move that is impulsive so you know euro is probably well positioned for some uh, usd uh, weakness on the other hand what is well positioned for um usd strength um to go back to this scenario are the metals because if you see both gold which i'm showing here and silver and I know that Blake showed very clearly yesterday the triple, let me go back to, to gold, the triple confluence that we have here uh, in, uh, in, in gold. Um, so, you know, theoretically speaking, we might see, you know, the area between 1235 and uh, 1240 uh, act as a support. But on the other hand, the price action tells me that the metals remain extremely heavy extremely heavy so especially especially if we get a hawkish fed or anyhow less dovish than the market might be pricing in or you can call it whatever you like that means that the treasuries are going to move lower that means that the yields are going to move higher we all know very very well the uh, the very good correlation that um, um, bonds and uh, metals have or the or if you want to put it like that the inverse correlation that yields and the precious metals have so if we indeed see a move higher in the yields you should expect the move lower in gold which is already uh, which has already made the break below the triangle accelerate and uh, you know even push towards the 1205 1204 low that we had there so I really think that the way they've been looking, uh, if, if we do get, uh, you know, dollar positive reaction, the metals are going to suffer probably more than anything at the moment. So obviously, if the opposite happens, then we rebound from where we currently stand. But still, that wouldn't even be enough to get me bullish because we would still need to clear multiple levels for us to to start, you know, looking at metals like more, in a more constructive way. Uh, so as I said, uh, dollar strength, probably the metals are best positioned to uh, to continue lower. Okay. Um, now having to do with risk, because we all know, we don't know how, uh, unfortunately, because, you know, in, in, in such bull markets like the one we've recently had, we've seen many many times event risk that we we were quite sure that you know if it goes one way it's going to be stock negative if it goes the other way it might be stock positive uh act in a stock stock positive way uh regardless of what happens so um 
I have to say that what I wrote in my analysis yesterday as well for the SPX, first of all, nobody can doubt the bullish nature of uh, stocks. Just, I mean, even if you look from uh, last year's uh, November election, we barely had any drawdowns. I mean, uh, especially if you look at the Dow, which is like, uh, you know, even more uh, parabolic, it's, it's more than clear that we, we've been in a very, very, very strong uptrend. But on the other hand, you know, the vast majority of the indices are like on, on some nice technical levels. And obviously the reward to risk ratio makes absolutely no sense being long ahead of the event risk. Uh, with the SPX, for example, being at the top of actually, let's have a look at it on the weekly chart. So you can, you can see it even better. Just look at it on the weekly chart. Look where the SPX is at the moment. I mean, this is a, quite nice ascending wedge. Uh, it's also the 2618 of this large, the, the biggest correction we've, we've had in the recent years, uh, which was in, in 2015, right? So it's the 261.8 of that. It's also uh, the 2618 of this little correction uh, that we had in November, um, if you go down to the daily. So, you know, I don't know what kind of an event the market will decide if it decides to uh, to view as or to view as um, uh, negative for stocks because yeah in the past we were always adamant that you know a hawkish Fed would make uh, stocks suffer but we've seen the Fed okay you can you can't actually call it hawkish but we we've definitely seen the beginning of a hiking cycle and that hasn't really uh, affected in a negative way stocks right so. Um, you know, whatever, the sure thing is that being positioned up here, like establishing fresh positions, expecting a move higher, obviously makes no sense from a reward to risk perspective. So you either stand on the side or if you're really brave, you try the short side with, you know, quite tight stop losses and see what happens. Um, so I think more or less, you know, the major markets that the vast majority of, of the people, mm, you know, something let me cover the Aussie, the Aussie, the Kiwi and the CAD as well, which are traditionally uh, pairs of interest. And then we can uh, we can go over some questions. And Blake is probably already with us or he's going to be like within five minutes. So the Aussie is still rebounding from the triple confluence of supports we had so far. So good. Obviously, today is going to confirm that this might be the beginning of like a, a, a bigger rebound than we, we've gotten used to having since we actually turned lower there, uh, or that it was another shallow uh, rebound. Um, the uh, key level in the Aussie, as I've, I've said multiple times, is the 76.40 area. And for Kiwi, the equivalent, equivalent level is the one we're actually almost testing at the moment. So the Kiwi is perfectly positioned. I mean, it's currently resist, on a resistance. So let's say that we, we see some uh, dollar strength coming through. Might get another rejection from the same area, the 69.70 in this case of, of Kiwi. On the other hand, we've already broken above this triangle. So if we, if we see some dollar weakness and... Uh, Aussie and Kiwi accelerate, we will probably also see daily closes above the levels that I was looking for confirmation, in which case the Kiwi should push towards the 200 EMA at 0.71, I think within just a few days. Uh, the Aussie, on the other hand, can definitely make it back to the 77.40 area. Okay. So these are the levels I will be looking uh, following that. Uh, we also see if you see some breaks in the RSI. I mean, the RSI was uh, capped by this descending uh, trend line for some time now. Uh, we, we, we're, we're seeing a break above it. You know, keep that in mind as well. And let's have a look, a look at the USD card, which has completely quieted down. Uh, I mean, we, we've had like as if you see we had like three consecutive uh two of them were spinning tops the other one was like a little hammer and uh, the daily candle today was also like a spinning top until like a few until a few minutes before we started the webinar so the usd card has stalled here 
it's within a range. Uh, things are very simple here. We break above 129, we're probably going to extend for at least one more leg higher. Might be 131.30, the 61.8. Now, on the other hand, if we see some USD weakness, uh, we, we still have some distance to cover until we find ourselves back at the range of support at 26.60. But until then, I'm, I mean, until we find the 126.60 in case we do see some uh, USD weakness, uh, you know, there are several pips to be made there. So obviously the reward to risk ratio is being short here, but that doesn't mean that that's going to work, right? I'm just saying that from a range trading perspective, you know, that's the best option at the moment. Uh, hey, Steve. Hey Blake. Hey, how's it going? Good. I just finished covering like all the major pairs, uh, you know, based on which is better position for USD strength, which is better position for USD weakness, so people can make perhaps the best choices if they if if they are considering trading like uh, uh, immediately after the event. Okay. Well, you know, I um I wasn't listening to you, uh, unfortunately um everything that you were you were you were uh, talking about I, I missed i missed it but because i was actually taking just a little bit of some dollar shorts that i've had um i took a little bit of profits off the table um just just you know reducing yeah, the of it, it makes yeah sense. <laughs> yeah um right but you know play blake on aussie nice call thanks you know i you know i'm still still trying to work still this there. around and uh, you know, gold starting to firm up here, and you know, it's it. There's there's a couple things that are working. I I actually think that the dollar, you know, is at risk now of um you know continuation uh, pullback here. You know, following this uh, this week CPI data, uh, it's going to be tough for the Fed to 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 really bolster inflation expectations and uh if if you're if you're sitting there going okay well i'm i'm expecting the dot plot to to adjust you know f and and show us that that the the fed's going to be more aggressive going into 2018 i doubt that that's going to be the case uh knowing what you know that 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 we have very tepid inflation on a consumer level still so um so anyway i think that that any by, any by pullback way, now but yeah. by the way blake um i just wanted to mention because i i would have left the dxy for last but you can show it you know we were we we've talked about the importance of the 9420 area multiple times in the dxy that's yeah, exactly the area we got rejected from once again right yeah it's the uh 618 retracement um you know real real big real big resistance and and uh, i think while we're below that there isn't much reason to be you know long the dollar at this at this stage in the game so um you know and, and again i i think it's 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 quite possible that uh that we we see you know the dollar maybe firm up a little bit ahead of the FOMC, but again, you know, at, you know, following the following um, the FOMC, following the statement, it's get, like I said, it's going to be really tough to see um, the Fed really try to uh, to 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 you know um, be too hawkish, and uh, and and I know Janet Yellen probably wants to go out on a high note, you know you know that that the economy is strong and yada 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 but you know the fact of the matter is is inflation is is weak and 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 so going back to your point steve i think that as long as we stay below the 618 retracement or the 94 you know 20 94 15 level uh it's real tough to 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 be long the dollar here especially after this uh decent recovery um did you what what let me let me ask you this steve so what currency pairs did you say would be uh you know a good potential on on a dollar rally dollar rally uh because it's not going to only be dollar rally it's going to probably be um uh yields rally as well i said that the metals are well positioned for more weakness because they, they've been very weak uh recently um, yes so uh dollar rally definitely that's the case on the other hand the usd yen is uh, well positioned to be rejected as long as we remain below this long term 
uh, descending uh, trend line that we've seen. So it, it does have some space for a rebound towards the 114, 114, 20 area. But, but regardless, as long as we stay below there, people should be very, very careful being long. On the other hand, I mentioned that uh, Euro, um, I mean, the fiber and, and the cable are well positioned for dollar weakness because, you know, the recent moves lower for the time being do not look impulsive, but rather more than corrective. Um, we, we said that uh, the Aussie and the Kiwi are very close to confirming that um, uh, strong rebounds might be in the cards. So if we do see some dollar weakness today, we should see uh, daily closes uh, for the Aussie above the 7640 area, which for me is key. And for the Kiwi, um, the, uh, 70, the 6970 area, which we're actually currently testing, which is also key for me. So these are the pairs we more or less covered. Also, also showed how the SPX is currently uh, both on the uh, weekly chart and on the daily chart on some resistance. So I said that, you know, you never know what happens with uh, U.S. stock indices since, you know, we, we've seen the relentless nature of this bullish rally. But obviously the reward to risk ratio being long up here makes no sense ahead of event risk, right? Yeah, I mean it. It. it the, I mean this is this is a, a scary place that we're at as far as the the S and P goes. You, you notice uh, here. Let me let me delete this lower line. Okay, so this is the upper trend line on a weekly basis. Okay, for the S and P, right? Weekly basis. All right, here we are. We're at a 261% extension, and, and and depending on how you you draw this and what S and P you're looking at, you know whether it's the futures. It's the exact or... same extension I was showing, and don't forget okay. that this is an extension. I said it of of probably the biggest corrective move we had since the beginning of the bull move, right? So this is an extension of a rather important corrective move in this bull trend. It, it yes, and so that that's why I, I'm, I mean, hell, uh, I, I and, and <laughs> if I was long equities, which b by the way, just just so you guys know, about three weeks ago I pared back my uh, my my even my retirement holdings are, uh, uh, three quarters of it went into cash. So that I mean that just shows you how hesitant I am while we're up here, is when I. <laughs> You know, I start taking, start fiddling around with my retirement stuff. Um, you know, that that that's when I, that's when I'm, you know, I, I I personally am. You can you can see that I'm worried. Doesn't mean it's right for you guys. I'm 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 in my mid 40s. You know, if you're in your you know mid 60s or mid 20s, you're gonna have a completely different outlook. So that's why I don't talk about my retirement stuff much because it's not. It's not rel it's relevant to me. It's not relevant to to you guys. But it, but if anything, it just shows you my hesitation in where we're at right now. Uh, and, and you know, can we go higher? I hope so. You know, <laughs> I do. But I've also I'm trying to be a realist of where we're currently at. Um, so that that's uh that that's I think this is all very important important resistance for the S and P. Um, now. As far as uh, as far as what do you do with dollar strength? I, you know, I I was uh, if we walk away today and we say, oh my God, the dot plot has changed and we are now looking at you know three, possibly four rate hikes in 2018, I will be shocked. But I've been shocked before, and I, I'm going to be the first one to admit I am not a very good Fed watcher. I'm not. I am. I, I'm. I admittedly am probably the worst Fed watcher out there. So um, you know, don't listen to me as far as like my predictions on what the Fed uh, will will or will not do. However, with the uh, the 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 overarching theme over the course of the last um, you know couple of couple of well several years has been just lack of inflationary pressures that we've seen and and you 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 see them kind of creeping up a little bit here and there but really it's just not making its way over to the consumer so uh, the CPI data was just a, a real kind of a, a a punch to the gut 
for anybody who is long the dollar. And you know, if you were long the dollar, you were thinking, "Oh my God, here we go." You know, the Fed's going to uh, the Fed's going to you know uh, really you know ratchet up expectations, and uh, you know, going into next year with the new Fed governor, Janet Yellen's going to leave on a hawkish tone. Yada yada yada. Um, problem is, is that you know you get this print, and uh, now dollar longs probably aren't so sure. And as Steve pointed out, this rejection's huge. I mean, this is a, a 618 to me is, you know, the ultimate fib golden ratio, you know, we start rejecting around these levels and you've got to start taking note. And right now we are rejecting here. And so that that in itself means that okay, the only way I can really get bullish the dollar is breaking above those highs. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. So breaking above those highs, that's where I get bullish the dollar. And and as I told you guys already, I've already started taking a little bit of profits on some dollar um, uh, uh, dollar shorts just because I've I've been I've been getting short the last uh, you know week or so. Um, it, you know, just short the dollar, and so I took a little bit of profits off the table, reduced risk a little bit, which makes sense. It, it totally makes sense. But um, Steve also talked about precious metals. In the event that the dollar does break out, which it could, like I said, I'm not, I'm not, you know, by any stretch of the means, the best Fed watcher, probably one of the more, you know, horrible Fed watchers out there. Um, let's say gold and silver break down. Well, one of the reasons why I put out a pattern in play for the uh, for gold yesterday, and you'll see it right here is confluence of supports. Now, what does that mean? I mean, we talked about it yesterday. You guys, uh, you know, and uh, you, you guys may have heard me discuss it all. Uh, we have a oops, shoot, I don't want to move that. Okay, let's let's talk about this gold. Okay. Gold right here hit 161% extension of this move. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. We hit a 78% retracement of this move. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Great. And then we hit a 50% retracement of this move. Boom. Boom. Fifty percent retracement. Okay, that's a confluence of supports, right? It's a confluence of fib levels. Now, when you 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 can identify multiple layers of, in this case, Fibonacci support levels, which I call a cluster. Okay, if you can identify a cluster of supports like that then you know when you're wrong. I, you know, Dale, are you still, are you listening, Dale, sometimes? I know you have it on mute. And yeah, I'm here. But you're, you're, probably, you're probably back there, you know, singing, singing songs and stuff. Yeah, it, what, 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 as a trader, there, there are very few things that we can control as a trader. What can you control? Uh, what your risk is on a trade. Bingo. So you can control yourself and, you know, and your, and your rules for entry. Um, but the one thing you can control pretty much, I mean, when I say pretty much, okay, there's that 1% chance that that you, you know, there's a big news event or, you know, for today, a, 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 a Fed event. Where yeah, overnight, prices, overnight your control of risk is a little bit less. Well, yeah, and, and I mean, because you might get some slippage on stops, but, but for the most part, I mean, 90 Eight, yeah. ninety-nine percent of the, the 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 fact of the matter is you can you can control your risk. Now I I could put in a stop. Let's say I was trading gold, and I'm not, by the way, just so you guys know. I very rarely trade precious metals. Sometimes I do, but I and I didn't trade this. I just you know, but it, the 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 patterns in play are educational to show you why uh, by the book something would be done. Okay, so. And I should be long gold, actually. I, I really should. I just got too much other exposure, so I didn't want to, you know, um, you know, 
add to you know get myself in a situation where I'm just too over leveraged and one on one side I, I just can't do that you know so I have I have to pick and choose my battles but that doesn't mean that I can't put out a pattern and play I know there's a lot of people that trade precious metals a lot more than I do but in this case let's say I decided to go long gold yesterday and I put my stop below you know here let's just call it 1233 1234 which you'll see 1229 is where we invalidate but because that that really proves the fact that we're wrong you know we compensate for a little bit of probe below there but if you get stopped out you know there might be some slippage you might instead of losing five points you might lose six or you know maybe seven you know if it's really fast moving markets but you can for the most part control your risk and that at any game, at any point in time is the most important thing as a trader because you can say, all right, well, um, if, if I'm going to get out somewhere right around here, you know, somewhere around here, and I'm looking to make somewhere around here, well, you have a risk, you're risking $1 to make three or four, or, you know, and it could even go even higher than that. So that's, that's the point of, of, of trading is being able to control your risk and saying, okay, if I'm wrong, this is where I'm wrong. Look, I, I, I bought the Aussie US dollar last week. Why did I buy the Aussie US dollar last week? Because I knew where I was wrong. Can you, look, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask everybody out in the, in the audience. Okay. Not Steve. Where where am I wrong in the Aussie dollar going long? Going long in the Aussie, where am I wrong? Steve. Shush. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, Shush. I've already said it a billion times the previous few weeks, so whoever is in, whoever is here, I think they know Blake what the risk is. Okay, so the the risk is really to me it's below seventy five cents. All right, it, it is. It's below 75 cents. This is a multi-year trend line. You know, it's also really interesting. I sat there and I was really perplexed last week because I was I was about ready to go along the Aussie dollar, and I was reading all these bank reports, and they're like, "Oh, multi, we're below the multi-year trend line." And I think what they were looking at, and I and I I'm, I might be wrong because a lot of them don't accompany charts when they when, whoops. Uh, I think what they were looking at was this. So, something that looked like that, and I, I and I was sitting there going, man, these guys are really off base. I, you know, and I read actually two or three multiple reports saying, you know, oh, that we broke through 75.40 uh, right here, we're below the multi-year trend line, and I'm like, hmm, I'm looking at a different trend line, which to me, okay, to me was it, it's very well defined, and there was also some fib levels down there too, just you know, FYI. So it's like the 78% retracement down here. You can see it right here. And so that confluence of supports between the trend line and the 78% retracement, I know that below 75 cents, I'm wrong. Period, end of story. That's it. There's no there's no if and or buts about it. And and I got asked this morning by Joe in our chat room. Here, here Joe, say hi. It, here's, our, here's our chat room. And there's like 87 of us. And there's Joe. Joe asks, hey, hey Blake, um, hey, there's Joe. Hey, Joe. She says hi. Um, Joe's in Canada, probably freezing her her toes off right now because I'm in Arizona and I and I actually might put on socks today, which is uh, weird. But anyway, Joe asked, um, Blake, you you don't wear uh, sandals over your socks, do you? Uh huh. Do you wear sandals over your socks? Uh, you wear socks and sandals. No, hell no. Yeah. That's that that that's that's a fashion faux pas. I, well, I'm not you know, like the I, most fashionable I, guy, I, but that is a fashion faux pas. We all become our dads eventually, Blake. No, uh, I, first of all, a my dad doesn't do that, and b even yeah. if my dad did that, I would never ever wear <laughs> sandals and socks. Or speak uh, to him again. <laughs> we're leaving the great. Right. But I, I, but Joe asked me, she goes, well, how about, a, and this is before the data, obviously, this is when, you know, the Aussie was trading down here around uh, 75, 60. She goes, well, you know, what if the dollar strengthens, you know, following the FOMC, what, what's the best trades out there? And I was like, well, if the Aussie dollar breaks, uh, I'll show you guys uh, wherever the wording is, Bill, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, 
wherever I wrote it. Uh, somebody posted a picture of Bieber. That's nice. I can I can't unsee that. That's unfortunate. Oh, uh, almost. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, I don't know where I wrote it. When the markets like, uh, are, when the market are, uh, markets are slow, we're really long on GIFs, yeah. right, Blake? So, yeah, right. Um, oh, here, right, right. Uh, here, Joe asked, uh, you know, hey, what what happens? I said below, uh, you know, seventy four ninety in the Aussie dollar, and it goes to hell in a handbasket. I mean, you know, that's exactly what I was I was writing at, you know. Uh, oh, an hour, almost two hours ago. Um, and, and, you know, these are the things that we talk about in the chat room and post pictures of Justin Bieber, apparently. Um, but but I, what I'm saying is if the Aussie breaks, it's gone. I mean, if the Aussie breaks 75 cents, we are going to see probably 70 to 72 cents immediately following. And you know what? If the dollar yen, if the dollar yen breaks through 114 right here, we're probably going to 120, but you got to prove it to me. The market's got to prove that to me, okay? Period. End of story. Like I don't. I, I at this at this point, I'm not a believer. That's a Justin Bieber, Bieber follower. If you guys didn't know, that was a good one. Well done, Blake. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> Thank hey, you. you were waiting for that, weren't you? You're were totally waiting for that. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep my day job. Um, so anyway, but this is another one. You know, if the dollar yen, yeah, if it breaks 114, it, it's gone. I mean, this this thing this thing will go this thing will go like this, and I'll be the first one to get stopped out because I'll probably be short. You know, as it approaches 114, but if it breaks through 114, I'll probably get stopped out, and I'll turn around, and go long, and get long, and hope the Dow goes up another 40,000 points from here. So at least. Um, at least, you know, I mean, but that that's 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 how I'd play it. And right now, as long as it stays below that red line right there, I can't be long. There's just it's impossible for me um, from a risk reward standpoint. I drew this, you know, days ago uh, on the actually this arrow was on the analysis from Friday uh, from Forex analytics. You know, it's just it, it's still been sitting there. I haven't I haven't removed it um, because that's how strongly I feel about it. You know, we get above that and it's, you know, game, game, game over, uh, game over. The Aussie's going, or the dollar yen's going so much higher. Anyway, um, I know we have just a couple of minutes uh, left. Uh, I want to, I want to say uh, to everybody out there, good luck today. Uh, it is the FOMC day. It is the last Janet Yellen meeting. Um, that makes it an important one and you got to listen to her tone and and what what's more actually what's more important though is what Steve pointed out earlier watch the bond market um, watch yields I think the you know the yields and gold are going to tell you the story uh, you know this is a pretty good uh, representation of what where yields are at and I think uh, our our, our sandbox if you will you know you break out of the sandbox yields break higher well guess what the dollar is going higher yields break lower guess what dollar is going to go lower it, it's it's it seems difficult to try to get through all the oh my god dot plots and was she dovish did she say that you know you can you can Take all that with a grain of salt, but really just watch the bond market. I think the bond market will really signal that to you, uh, what's going to happen. And then also at the same time, watch precious metals. If precious metals bounce, the dollar is probably going to go down. There aren't there aren't a lot of correlations right now that have been working in the FX market the last couple of years. I mean, things have been off. Commodities have been doing their own thing. The yen's been doing its own thing. But if there's if there's a couple things that are actually working quite well right now is gold is an inverse relationship of the dollar, you know, loosely speaking. And bond yields or bonds are a good you know, parallel or inverse relationship to the dollar as well. So if we can get bond yields going, let's let's just say because we're going down right now, bond yields going down, do, uh, gold's going up. I'm pretty confident that the dollar is going to get blasted today. Flip side, yields rally, we break out, gold starts breaking down. 
I'm pretty sure that the dollar is going to, you know, break you know, that 618 retracement. So that's what I'm watching today. And hopefully that helps you guys and gals out at home. So you don't have to worry about sifting through all the, the noise. And, you know, uh, you, you know, you have, if you have this up and you're trying to read this as it's coming by, you know, and you're going, oh, what did she say? What did she say? What did she say? Uh, you, your best bet is probably just, you know, uh, watching bonds and gold. <laughs> Hopefully that helps you out. And Blake, okay. if yeah. I may add, you know that I'm usually the last person to, to make a sales pitch, but, you know, it will just take whoever wants, like, one minute to register and start their $1 trial so they can be with us during the event risk. In the chat room, they can also be receiving updates and notifications about whatever is happening, right? That, that's right. And 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 if if you do take your trial to get in the chat room, you have to click right here and go. It says go to the chat room. It, it, you when you are on a when you are with us less than six months, or you do not have an annual or a semi semi annual subscription, you can't participate in the chat room, but you can read the, what everything that we're saying. So, um, you know, if you have a semi-annual or annual plan with us, then you, you can participate and talk and chat. But, um, but when you're on trial, um, you know, taking a trial of Forex Analytics and just seeing, you know, how you like the tool, uh, make sure you download the app and then make sure you go right here where it says go to chat room and it'll take you right there. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve, for bringing that up. Uh, Dale, I'm going to pass it over to you. You guys, good luck today, and uh, and I'll see you tomorrow for sure. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Steve. Right. Hello, Giuseppe. By trading more, your brother. I'm making you the presenter. Looking forward to talking to you. It's been too long. Waiting to hear your voice. See your screen. By trading more, your brother. <laughs> Hi there, can you uh, hear Giuseppe, me? I can hear you. Very good. How are you, first of all? Oh, I, I'm great, <laughs> buddy. And uh, God, I mean, you know, I believe that you were my inaugural interview when I first tried the other side <laughs> of the mic. It's That's been right. on your side of the mic for decades, and That's right. uh, I believe yeah. For the first interview I did at Laura on FX Street. Uh, do you remember? Were you the first? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it was May 2014, actually. Yeah. So uh, it was yeah. 2014, and uh, yeah, it was great, actually. You know, we were uh, reviewing, I remember we were reviewing the Euro and uh, looking at the Euro before the drop um, uh, and uh, and also after the drop. I always mentioned that 121. <laughs> we have, we were almost there, yeah, I <laughs> but yes, that. I mean, you know, you know, I have to thank you, Dale. I have to thank and, you, Dale, uh, because I, you are uh, into this. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, Giuseppe, I, I, you know, I recall um, finding you on Twitter, and I would have to say that you were <laughs> one of my best finds on Twitter. Um, you know, I haven't been following your work uh, lately. But um, I was always impressed with it, and I, I know we're going to get into talking a little bit about your work, but you sent me an email, I don't know, probably about four months ago, and you received one of the most prestigious awards that you can receive as a technician in your new adopted country, Canada. <laughs> what was that award? And, That's right. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. I know you don't like to brag, but... Um, that was that's something that uh, many traders, analysts in their career, uh, envy would love to have that after their name. So, <laughs> well, I mean, I was go ahead. I was really, I was really not expecting it, uh, and um, it actually uh, was um, related to an adaptation of um, of a work I've done in my master thesis. Um, it was the work is about. Uh, showing how uh, money management can not only affect returns, but also can affect um, uh, reaching objectives in trading, which which uh, which obviously uh, returns uh, are only part of it, right? Because when you talk about objectives, there is also a probability attached to uh, to the return that you that you get. And, and the um, name of the and the name of the society. 
The name of the society is the Canadian Society of Technic Analysts, which is part of the um, is the Canadian chapter of the IFTA, the International Federation of Technic Analysts. Okay. And uh, as you know, it's it's kind of an umbrella organization, and uh, and they have in each uh, in each country they have. Um, uh, they have a national uh, association, and basically, uh, this is a this is a non-profit organization. What we do, uh, we actually foster the use of tech analysis, analysis in uh, you know in uh, in the industry, not only retail but also uh, but also uh, but also professionals. There's a lot of professionals, believe it or not, <laughs> still do not use uh, tech analysis or, very, or, or actually make very little use of it. And actually, here in Canada, what's happening? I think it's it's happening everywhere. Um, basically, the big companies are getting rid of of the uh, traditional tech analysts, right? That they're all moving into quants. Uh, in fact, someone, uh, so some people believe that tech analysis will, will eventually be renamed as <laughs> quant analysis. But I don't believe that. I think there is still a lot of value in what we do. <clears throat> oh, are, are you talking about that? A lot of people think that we're just going to go to AI and black box trading and it's going to replace people. Well, I, I've been asking this question to some of the uh, professional um uh, professional members of the organization, and we're talking about also big, big boys, big guys who manage two billions uh, for BMO, uh, Bank of Montreal, and uh, uh, you know, and the kind of and the like of. So, um, what they say, and the question I had was, uh, do you think that the use of tech, uh, the use of artificial intelligence applied to the market is going to change the market um, um, in a f fundamentally? I mean, structurally. And what he says is that, well, the market is already changing, but what I believe is that um, uh, different people are going to bring different approaches uh, to um, the way they look at the market, and it's reflected in their artificial intelligence uh, algorithms. So he believes that overall the market will not change, which means that on the larger time frames, we will still be able to use the tools that. Uh, that we use, so which was actually refreshing for me because yeah, so, so, you know, actually, so actually it's for people that use uh, drill down on one hour and thirty minute, maybe even four hour, that the high frequency traders are going to create uh, these types of anomalies that weren't there before. Well, um, uh, uh, algorithms are there, Dale, already, yeah. uh, even in the Forex market, okay? To be honest, in the last three years, I've not noticed any any changes when it comes to the four hour, for sure, and even the okay. hourly. In fact, I use the 45 minutes, uh, 48 minutes uh, proficiently, and it's pretty stable, actually. Of course, if you go down 15, 10, uh, sometimes I time on the 10 uh, minutes, and uh, still, still you can you can work with it. Right now, um, I believe the you know the forex market for for retailers. I mean, it's pretty small market, it's only five percent. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I I didn't find at least that's my personal experience. I don't know if anybody else um, has shared the same. Okay. And well, uh, yeah, so yeah. Why don't we talk about what sets you apart, at least what I notice that sets you apart from <laughs> standard uh, Fibonacci traders, and I know that's a big part of what you do, but what is yeah. unique about your work is uh, your focus on program trading levels that you're able to spot before the markets achieve those levels. So you want to talk a little bit about yes, how you the, use uh, program trading levels? Yes, that's I the main I think we came idea. up with the term Footprints. Footprints. Yes, that that's what was your uh, was your suggestion actually. The elephants, the algo algo footprints. <laughs> now, the, <laughs> um, yes, I mean, um, uh, can you see my screen? By the way, can you see my uh, yeah, chart? Yes, we have a weekly, daily, and uh, four hour Perfect. up there. So the best, probably the best way, and maybe I'm gonna give you also an update of where I think the US dollar Japanese yen is going. Okay. And, uh, you know, I love this market. This market is one of the most. I mean, it's, it's a very technical market. I, uh, uh, you know, uh, the if yen you, in if particular, Giuseppe. Pardon me. The yen or forex in general. Um, no, particularly the US Japanese yen. Okay. Um, and uh, probably uh, you will remember. Probably it was around the beginning of 2016 here, uh, and there were a lot of people. Uh, 
talking about the yen moving higher, right? I remember one of the levels that was mentioned was 123, but the reality is that, you know, when we look, I, I use Fibonacci in a non-conventional way, if you wish, and um, I basically use some rules, and some of those rules, I mean, are, are uh, I also, um, um, you know, they are open, they are, they are, I share them, not all of them, but many of them. So, uh, the idea here is that when we trace and we get our retrace into the 50% the market retraces and then uh, false participation at those levels, then I'm looking at these two other levels. Uh, this is nothing new really. I mean, you know, 23.6% and 61.8%, which is also the XOP um, Jody Napoli level. I mean, so we're not talking about anything new here. The idea is that by using these traces, we can actually frame price Right, so I have a rule here. The second target is it. Price goes above the second target. It trades from highs to highs. And the reason why, at some point, I said the uh, the yen is done and is going to go is going to move uh, lower, and that was around this area here, end of 2015, beginning of 2015, 16. Sorry, uh, is that the sequence clearly failed at some point. So we had participation around this area here twice. Price got into that first target. And I'm just showing this example here before we get into the future, okay? Before we get into what I believe the um, um, the uh, US dollar Japanese yen is doing. But basically, uh, what I what I'm trying to show here is that we can use Fibonacci certain rules to frame uh, to frame price structure, okay? And that's what I do. Now, when we see here, if we zoom here a little bit into this so little um, that program trading level, which was tested a few times, finally gave way. Yes. Uh, you defined it exactly. as a sequence being broken and a Correct. shift in thread. And that's the 116.07 level that you see here. This little uh, breach here, a few pips, indicated right. to me that the move higher was ended. And so the algos, what they did, or this class of algos that, uh, you know, we are able to model like this. I didn't come up with all of this. Of course, I had other people looking at this as well. But basically, once that that uh, uh, level is broken, then uh, algos reverse, and algos drive the market. Uh, they actually are the powerful force, and this is a very large time frame, as you can see. It is a weekly yes. time frame, right? Yeah. And so, and and. I mean, you know, and then first and second target hit, look at how precise, you know, uh, these areas might be. And this market is particularly technical. First target hit, the market retraces, the market retraces into, and I'm just applying some of the rules. They're always the same rules. I'm not, not trying to cheat them, you know. We did these things before the fact and so on. So uh, I, want to, I want to look at the future here, okay? Because all this analysis doesn't make sense if we, we are not able to apply to the future, right, uh, right Dale? So exactly. let me let me see what I uh, speaking about the future. What you predicted in the past, uh, I remember even two years ago uh, when a lot of people were starting to get real bearish, and myself included, looking for a correction in the stock market. Uh, you had programmed trading levels that at that time seemed like the twilight zone to me, up around 26, 2700, and uh, here we are. So. Uh, you, that yeah, provided you with a great macro view and saved you a lot of money and and probably followers that listened to you about not trying to play the short side the of that. Short market. Yeah. Yeah. No, that nice that helped as well. And yeah. Nice call. Thanks. That helps as well. Now that, that the condition we have there, and we might review that later on because I I I, I like to talk about that as well. I also had uh, one paper recently. Uh, published uh, on the CSTA journal. So, um, uh, but uh, before we get there, because that, that's very interesting market to look for, uh, to look at. And I think we have, uh, we have a, uh, the conditions for, an, for another 1987, it's are, are, are actually being prepared. And I don't want to be too doomy here, but I'm gonna show you what I, what I mean there. Okay. Um, but let me just continue on this because I wanna show you where we are gonna, I believe we are gonna go in the US, US or Japanese yen, okay? And I think there is still plenty of opportunity to get on board of this um, of this trend. Now, there was here a 108.80 uh, support, one, two, three, four times, many times. This this area held. Okay, 
while the dollar index was correcting, uh, basically the uh, US dollar Japanese has moved laterally. Okay. Now, the uh, good news uh, uh, came actually just uh, a couple of uh, months ago here. This is a weekly chart. Okay. What happens here is that, um, sorry, that's not the right, the right trace, sorry. The right trace is that, I do this trace uh, all uh, before they happen. And when, once they're tested, once this level is tested, I never change these trades, okay? Uh, I don't go and uh, mess around with these things. So as you can see here, if we read this, this chart, what happened here? Market went down, bulls supported um, the US or Japanese yen around 109, price went higher into the area where bear were ready and actually they actually acted and as you can see this market yeah. moved naturally how did you handle here? that one red candle where it closed it underneath that support level what this do you one? do when you you know it oh, was kind of i lost a, money here <laughs> what? I, I lost money here because i was believing that see we had a lot of we had, we had dump money also trying okay. to move my market lower but Right. Eventually, then you know uh, the hip stocking timing. Which that, is nice. that was a great bear trap there. Yes, yeah. it was, and actually it took me. So, All right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, but but I have to say, I mean, this trend higher and this trend lower, this trend higher and this trend lower, they were very very good actually. Okay. Now, what we're seeing here, can you see something something uh, familiar here, uh, Dale? <laughs> Look at the. Look at what happened here. I'm making it a little bit bigger for you. Can yeah, you see, see here what happened? Uh -huh. So it's a break, right? So yeah. to me, to me, uh, that means that bears are not interesting, at least uh, program trading bears are not interesting in pushing this price lower any longer, okay? And look at what happened after that break, magic. Right. What happened? The 50% came in and supported price, right? So right. where is this market going? We have two targets now. We have the larger targets, which is represented by the 50%. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make it uh, a little bit um, uh, bigger here. Okay, uh, just that you all know what the level is. It's 123, This level, believe it or not, is justified by the market being held uh, in this area here. And this is a very technical market. So. When these kind of things happen, I really uh, take note and I really act on them. And there is a closer target, which is the one that I'm looking for at the moment, 116.40 uh, here, which is the uh, the closer target of this inner 50%, if you wish. Okay. So to me, it doesn't matter what's happening now. I mean, yes, we are in a correction of our index today. It's kind of uh, correcting a little bit. Um, and uh, I've been analyzing the index forever. I, I uh, personally believe it's in a, it's turning around uh, and moving higher and user Japanese seems to confirm that. I don't know. Do you have any questions about this? I mean I did, I mean I I reviewed this just yeah. to showcase what I you know you know you know what I do. I mean that's I mean it's for, for and you and you always have your line in the sand and that's if the sequence is broken. Correct. That's the 61.8 percent level, oh, okay. level here. Okay and okay. the levels that you come up with um, where you see program trading, they coincide with bid levels. How are you able to know in advance without giving away the store what levels you should be looking at based upon uh, modeling and uh, algorithm? How do you know before we get there that there's going to be buying or selling interest? At but those if, you think, if you think if you think about uh, this process that I just showed you, right? I showed this process in a very large time frame. Now the idea is that if you repeat the same process in a very small time frame, whenever the uh, trend has broken, is broken, right? That's an indication that the smaller time frame, it's not uh, does not have the power to overcome the larger time frame, and that's and that's when I get the confirmation that there is participation at those levels. So basically, it's the same exact same concepts. But apply in a fractal way to to a smaller time frame. That's the that's the, the main idea there. Okay, so uh, Gwen uh, uh, Giuseppe said 123 and 116 and change, uh, one shorter term, one longer term for his levels in the end. 
Um, so Giuseppe, uh, you, I see that you know you you were talking about that report that you wrote uh, that kind of gives us a look, a peer into the future, uh, published by the Canadian Society of, of TA, and you discuss uh, three intermediate and long-term scenarios for U.S. markets. Uh, do you want to go there, or? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean that's that's been interesting because. Um, um, I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't know when things are going to happen, okay? I mean, I don't, don't, I don't have the crystal ball. I only try to, uh, to get uh, an idea of what could happen and how we, um, you know, how we, uh, we react to that. So, again, I mean, it's good to work on the weekly, and, um, and, and this is the... Um, Continuous contract of the uh, ES, the SP500. This is a delayed contract, but delayed uh, um, um, data here. But that's that's not really important. Okay. Uh, what is important is that this market um, retraces 50% on uh, historically from zero, from uh, from actually the the first versions of the SP500, the SP. Um, I think it was the SP54. So if we go back to history, right, and yes. uh, and we actually we get the previous version of the SP500. Uh, basically, we got uh, um, you know uh, at the beginning it was very very small price here. We got a 50% bounce uh, in 2003, and now you see here a break. But this is just because of the way the continuous contract is calculated, right? I mean, the people who were trading know very, very well that markets stop at a funny 666 level, okay? Yeah. And the reason yeah. why you see this, uh, this level lower here, 479, is just because it's a continuous contract, so it does not reflect the previous uh, historical data in the right way. But basically what Dale was, uh, was saying before is that uh, you know, I've been mentioned in this first target, 1943, and and also the second target, uh, 2500. The market went well above that level there. Okay, and right. uh, the idea here is now that what, what happens when we get um, markets well uh, beyond that uh, second target? Well, you know, a 1987 scenario uh, might might happen. Might happen. Okay, and I want to bring. I share with the Dale um, uh, the link of uh, of a uh, of that article that I um, sure that I have. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you here an excerpt of that, and this is just historical data of the uh, SP 500 with the 50% retrace on the 74. So these uh, these uh, traces. Uh, hold on historical data as well, which means that modern algorithms have internalized something about something fundamental about about um, the uh, psychology of the market. Okay, so what you see here in '74, it's a 50% retrace from from the very beginning of uh, SP500. Okay, what happened after that is the market moved into the first target, and then it moved into the second target. That was 195. Okay, this was '74 in preparation for the 90, um, uh, uh, 1987. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to have another 1987, okay? This is just a scenario. This is something that could happen. And historically, what happened after 85, 86, the market moved another 54% above, above that second target. Up to okay. the, uh, this level, which is uh, what you see here, is the high of 1987, okay? So, okay. After that, what we had was an extension from highs to highs, okay? And we got price right into that area and the uh, market continued higher. So that's what I see here at the moment, okay? I don't know when this is going to, how high this is going to go. This might be going to go another uh, year, another two years. I really don't know. But what I want to leave you with, and this is, uh, I believe this is very, very important, is if you keep tracing from highs into thousands, to whatever new high you have, you're gonna get a pretty good idea of where the market, if we have a flash crash, but even if you don't have a flash crash, even if we have, if we if we just have a correction, where the market could go. So if the high was the high printed today, right? Can you see that if we get a very yes. dramatic event, 
to make a coup going to 2120. And mark my words, Dave. That's Dave, a breakout. This is going to, this is going yeah. to, this is going to uh, be. I mean, if we really get, um, uh, you know, a dramatic event, that's what we're going to get. <clears throat> right. You get it, and everyone will say that's been wrong for hundreds of handles. I told you the market was going to crash one day, but the crash is only going to take it back to the highs of last year, 21. Hundred, if we were in that eighteen hundred to twenty one hundred range, it just brings you back to the breakout. Yeah, that's that's the idea. That's the idea. And actually, these models here are confirming what you what you say. Actually, so I think it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting that uh, that there is a convergence there. But you know, it happened in the past. It might happen in the future. We don't know. Personally, I don't know when. A lot of people believe that eighteen because of interest rates coming out, going higher and a low, um, uh, historically uh, low uh, VIX uh, uh, volatility. And I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the future. I can only, in fact, I will not act on this. Uh, my my my, uh, my models only tell me when to, in this case, when to buy, not when to sell. Okay. Uh, they don't tell me the exact time. Right? They just tell okay. me that if we get there, we might need to test for. Um, well, the yen, will, the yen will tell you, Giuseppe. <laughs> yeah, probably yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. why don't we take a few minutes to show Phipps Stalker's website? And I know you sent me an email. Uh, you have several offers that I believe would be great edification for the community. First of all, the complete PDF of your intermediate and long-term scenarios for the U.S. market. Um, that you're also offering. This is new since I last talked to you. Uh, a six-hour free course for people. Yeah, I've, uh, and is, yeah, do, I've been do you teach that, or is it all on? Um, is it all uh, made right. up, and you just send it out PDF? So, so this is uh, it's actually video-based, the deal. Okay. And um, I was invited to speak at the Western Ontario University, and I created a one-day seminar for them. Where I share all my main, uh, you know, concepts, and uh, I thought it, you know, this would be useful for anybody who wants to uh, look at this kind of way of uh, of modeling the market. So uh, it's six-hour videos, and you can register here. I mean, it's all free, and uh, you know. Okay, just for, you have some uh, testimonials there, and so that's free, and it's a six-hour course, and then uh, you're going to be coming up with some type of uh, what does what does EOD stand for? Like EOD? EOD. Uh, EOD, end of day. End of day. End, end of, day. of day. Yeah. And okay. uh, so you're, you're beta testing that in uh, now and you'll be launching that in 2018. Yes. We, I also, I will also have, um, we'll also probably have a room in the future, but for now it's going to be a signal. So, um, and it's, uh, they're not very frequent. You might get one or two signals per uh, per week. Sometimes we don't get signals. So that's for, uh, you know, that's for um, uh, for traders, also part-time traders who um, who maybe don't have, don't have a lot of time and um, they just want to review the uh, the signals and put on the orders and and, uh, and go on. Uh, I'll probably oh, will have, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, just saying, no, you know, no. um, yes, but that's it. I mean, just uh, for, for part-time trader or people who do not have a lot of uh, time. In the future, I'm probably going to uh, extend that to intraday analysis, not signals, because it's pretty di difficult to to give signals uh, during the day, but definitely the analysis and entry areas. And well, um, I I'm going to have to call my attorney because number five, you did not get my permission to uh, use my, uh, uh, my positioning in your newsletter. Your positioning? Yeah, additional, no, up there, number five. Number five? Course. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not true. <laughs> but that's not true, Dave. Well, who, said, <laughs> who said you could, who said <laughs> you could publish my trades? Okay, okay. Let, let me tell you. Let me tell you what, what I call dump money. Okay, but people, people, I, I don't want people to hate me because of this. Yeah, okay? I respect every uh, position to uh, to everyone. But anyway, this yeah, area no. here, 
the value I've, added between. <laughs> I, 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 I warned the Duns hat, buddy. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I want to I want to thank you. You talked about time for taking the time of being here. You're Great to welcome. have you on Face, Giuseppe, and people could find you. Uh, you're not too active on Twitter, so for all of these authors, not, uh, not, uh, not recently, but I eventually I will now because I um, I'm now full time uh, trading and. Uh, you know, okay. eventually I'll get a little, a little get more active there as well. Okay, so it's at Fibstalker, and uh, his website is www.fibstalker.com. Giuseppe Bazil, my trading warrior brother, Merry Christmas to you. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you all. Thanks for inviting me, Dale, and, uh, you know, uh, I hope to uh, hear from you soon. Okay, and may pips rain down on you, and all your mentees <laughs> and subscribers uh, for the rest of the year and have a great 2018. Just and, uh, I always I always root for you. Thank you very much, Dale. I mean, you're very kind and the same I wish uh, to you all the best for, uh, for the new year and also this initiative. I mean, I, uh, I have to uh, commend and congratulate you for uh, you know, for uh, setting up a great community here. <clears throat> oh, thank you so much, Giuseppe. And uh, it's been three years since darker days for me now, and uh, I'll always remember how you were there for me. Uh, and thank you I, I have a memory like an elephant. So the best of luck with Footprints. I encourage anyone who's here to check out Giuseppe Bazil at fibstalker.com. And I don't think you're going to be disappointed, and it could be another arrow in your quill to attack the markets with so good hunting buddy good luck into the fed and thank you uh, good to you as well. it was, it was great having it i'm right, just waiting so. i mean <laughs> all right so uh, be safe and uh, talk to you soon bye bye now okay uh, as they say in your home country ciao brother ciao 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 see you soon all right bye bye now. and that's uh, <laughs> that's our session having. everybody and I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Uh, 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 maybe I'll see everyone in the other chat room around Fed time. Good hunting. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. See everyone. If I don't see in the chat room, see it tomorrow. Um, I have Lydia Item Finkley with us for tomorrow. Thanks again, Giuseppe. Adios, everyone. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.